All right, Eden. So we have an interesting topic tonight, which is if it's appropriate to Davin to ask Hashem to, I guess, nudge someone that they do tshuva. You're asking Hashem that someone else should do tshuva. Is this an appropriate tefillah? So let's uh, begin. What? You have to be at first on that level. We mean for him to do to, someone who's it's a, uh, it's a lot of things in this problem. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of details. But let's for, he needs it. You really have to be. Actually, I saw someone who wrote that. But let, let's see the, let's first understand the problem and then we'll get to the solutions. So before we get to the solutions, which is a number, we have a few sources there in the Hebrew packet, three different sources. But before we get to those sources, let's look at the English text and we're going to f- understand the problem. What could possibly be the problem <coughs> with, um, with asking Hashem for someone else to do teshuva? What could possibly be the problem? It seems to be a virtuous thing, Davin, that someone else should do teshuva. Is it not? So let's first understand the problem. And just as a, I understand the question. If you're asking Hashem, the guy doesn't know you're, that you're doing this. No, you're, you pray for someone who's sick, that they be healed. So you pray for someone who is who left the fold. You're praying that they should do teshuva. The same way you're praying for someone who's sick or someone to have parnasa. Whatever your requests are for Hashem, your request here is that so and so should do teshuva. Is that an appropriate request? So let's first understand the problem. And just to, you know, as I was preparing it today, it, it, it made me like think of, you know, there, there really is nothing under the sun that our sages didn't consider. Really nothing. In the last 3,000 years of Jewish literature, there's, there, there is not an area in life in which there's not a thoughtful uh, discussion. It's just a question of digging a little bit to find it. And in this case, I was aided entirely by a, uh, Facebook group called Makotis. Someone started a Facebook sources. group called, yeah, Makotis means sources. And th- there are like these groups in which people discuss Torah ideas, but this group is no discussion allowed, only sources, requests for sources, and the comments are response for sources. So it's a great uh, resource, and sometimes I'll ask and sometimes I'll answer, and sometimes just see what other people ask. So in this case, someone asked, uh, I remember reading a response from Rabbi Feinstein about whether or not you can. Pray for someone else to do teshuva. And someone in the comments puts four or five different sources, look them up, and from those sources, look up other sources and other sources, and you see a whole discussion on a question that we didn't even think last week was a legit question. But uh, it's a discussion. And like this, in everything in life, there's not an area, in, 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 and the more we do, especially with these kinds of learning, you know, when you do Gemara, you're learning whatever you're learning. So you see the discussion as it progresses. But when we do things like this, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy doing this. It's because it's random in some sense. So it ends up collecting from such a broad spectrum of ideas and perspectives. You get a much, like you start to see how big Torah is, you know, how, how much it covers. So having said that, this is one such question that I did not think was a question until I saw someone post it. And then when I saw it last week, they're looking at me like, what's the question? So having said that, between now and next week, between now and next Wednesday, Think of a question, a topic, an area in life that you would be interested to hear about, and I'll be thrilled to do the research and find the sources because they exist. It's just a question of finding them. And especially now with digital what's libraries, the looking is, the searching is, is spoon fed to you. It's easy. What, what's this? We're on Facebook. You go, what's, it's called What's the Source? What, what it's called Makotis. It's a group called, there's, there's these groups sorry, on Facebook called, called Makotis. Someone invited me to join the group. I could join, and it's a group. People post. Anyone know the source for X, sir? And then comments with sources. I thought you do the bike one because to me the bike is very good because in Miami. Yeah, okay, so, there, so, up. It's very so I, I actually know where to look, but I, I, I don't have a copy of the text, but I'm going to find it. I'll, I'll find a couple of next week. So, Mr. Shem, by next week, we'll find it. So. Okay, so we're going to do the bike one next week, God willing. All right, so let's first understand the problem. What could possibly be the problem with davening that someone else should do to show? That seems to be the most noble prayer. Okay, sorry? You could see, well, I like I said, one thing I could see, like, who you. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Why not? No, you can let's, see, see let's see. Let's see. We're going to find everything. Let's see. So first, let's see why, what the source oh, would the be. Asks well, let's see. Let's see. So before, first, we're going to see the source, the initial source, which um, seems to imply, actually states almost explicitly that one should, and it's a good thing to pray that someone else did the shiva. And then we're going to see the counter uh, argument, and then we'll try to make some sense out of it. So let's see. This comes from the Gemara, Brachas, Tafyudah Madalaf, Brachas 10a, a very famous passage of the Gemara. 
which reads during the English there, but you can look at the Hebrew if you'd like. Page. The first page of the English text. Here. With regard to the statement of Rabbi Yehuda, son of Rabbi Shimon ben Pazi, that David, King David, did not say hallelujah until he saw the downfall of the wicked. So the Gemara re relates the following. There were these hooligans. Rashi actually translates it as ignoramus is not hooligans, but the literal translation of the Gemara, Beryoni, is hooligans. But as I just noted, Rashi translates them as uh, ignoramus, ignoramuses. But anyway, there were these hooligans in our mayor's neighborhood who caused them a great deal of anguish. Rabbi Mayer prayed for God to have mercy on them, that they should die. To have mercy on them? Yeah. And they should die? Yeah. Yeah. Why die? If you have mercy on them, why die? As I, so Rabbi Mayer prayed, <laughs> Rabbi Mayer's wife, Peruya, said to him, what is your thinking? On what basis do you pray for the death of these hooligans? Do you base yourself on the verse, as is written, let sin, let sin cease from the land, let sin cease from the land, which you interpret to mean that the world be better if the wicked were destroyed. Actually, Gemara tells elsewhere that the death of the wicked is a favor to them too, because it gets, it gets them their cleansing and whatnot. But anyway, here he's talking about the world. It's better if the world didn't have them. So, but Beruria challenged his, her husband and said, but it is written, let sinners, but is it written, let sinners cease? What it does say is, it says, let sins cease. Yitamu, not choytim, which is talking about the people that they should seize, but rather chata'im, sins, let sins stop, not sinners. So you should not be praying that sinners come to an end, but you should be praying that their sin come to an end. Because the verse is not that they, right? It's a, it's, it's a very subtle distinction. It's, it's with a vav or without a vav. It's choytim with a vav, that would be sinners. But the correct word is, the, the correct reading of the verse is chata'im, sins. They should stay, but their sin should stop. So one should pray for the end of their transgressions, not for the demise of the transgressors themselves. This is Beruya in her inside telling her husband. Beruya, by the way, is, sorry? She's, uh, she's, she's the wife of Rabbi Meir, known as a scholar, a number of places in the Gemara. She comes up as having very as a sharp wit and deep sense of knowledge and understanding. And- um, She's Meir Balanes? No. Oh, okay. Rabbi Meir from the Mishnah is like uh, the colleague of Rabbi Hudor, Rabbi Shem Bayachoy, that generation. So her, his wife is Bruria. She's, she's been known around Talmud. She's, you see her. She comes up quite a few times. Some of the most difficult parts of Smith are thanks to her. Anyway, okay. So the story continues. Moreover, which, continues which Bruria. Sorry? Which Rabbi Meir is this? Okay, Meir of the Mishnah. No, we won't tell you. Yeah, it's the same one, no? Yeah. And Meir Balanes is the same one. I don't think. No, I don't think so. The Mishnah is... Okay. Fine. Moreover... Um, sorry? Okay, moreover, go to the end of the verse, said Bruria, where it says, and the wicked will be no more. So the verse reads, Yitamu chatayim, let sins come to an end. And then the verse continues, um, and there should be no more wicked. If, as you suggest, transgressors, the people shall cease, that refers to the demise of the evildoers, how is it possible that wicked will be no more, i.e. that they will no longer be evil? In other words, when it says that made enam means they're no longer wicked. If you are suggesting that they die and that's the way sin comes to an end, then the second half of the verse, which reads, they will no longer be wicked, will never apply because they died. So the verse clearly implies that they should stay alive, but their sin should end. Rather, said a mayor, said a brewer, pray for God to have mercy on them, that they should repent. As if they repent, then the wicked will be no more, as they will have repented. So the mayor saw that Bruria was correct and he prayed for God to have mercy on them and they repented. This is the original source for the story. This is the original source for the notion that a person pray for someone to do Teshuvah and the Gemara's framed the story in such a way that this was the correct behavior. Yeah. Um, but what we're going to read now is a, a very strong indication that this is incorrect and that we have to substantiate the story in the Gemara. Right, because the story in the Gemara still remains fact as a story. The Gemara itself doesn't say Bururia was wrong, or the Gemara doesn't say that you know that a mayor counted and said you were wrong. 
the mayor says, you're right, the exception, the Gemara leaves the story as that, as if this is the proper way. So we need to understand that considering the sources that are about to follow. Right? So you already know the answer to the question, are you allowed to pray for someone to the tissue? But the answer is yes. The question is to frame it, to understand it, and what that means. So second text on page two. The Gemara in Brachas, who I didn't change the page number, it's supposed to be Lamed Gimel. I wrote there, Yud and it's supposed to be Lamed Gimel, which is 33. So a number of pages later in the Gemara, the Gemara reads as follows. Very famous Gemara as well, which reads like this. Tangentially, no, tangentially, the Gemara cites an additional statement by Rabbi Hanina concerning principles of faith. Huh? Tangentially. Tangentially, tongue twister. Okay, so the Gemara brings another statement from Rabbi Hanina. It means, it means, by the way, you know, as an aside. Tangent. No, it's just from one thing leading to the next. It's a deviation. Yeah. Okay, so the Gemara says like this. It's not uncommon that the Gemara will quote a statement from one person, and then the Gemara will say, oh, you know what else he said? And you know what else he said? And you know what else he said? And a bunch of unrelated statements, but just all coming from the same author. It's not uncommon. So that's what happens in this Gemara here. And the Gemara says the following statement. And Abu Khalina said, everything is in the hands of heaven, except for the fear of heaven. Man has free will to serve God or not, as it is stated. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you other than to fear the Lord your God, right? So the Lord asks man to perform these matters because ultimately the choice is in his hand. Now, in understanding what exactly is included in the statement, everything is in the hands of heaven, with the exception of fear of heaven. So what exactly constitutes fear of heaven and what constitutes the everything that's in the hands of heaven. Right? So it says Rashi, Hakobi Deshamayim, everything is in the hands of, of heaven. Kol Habal Adam, whatever happens to a person. Biyada Kadesh Baruch Hu is from the hand of God. What are these things that we refer to? Go for example, Katzer, Aruch Katzer, is it going to be tall or short? Ani Asher, is it going to be poor or rich? Chacham or Shaita, is it going to be wise? Or, or not so smart. Love and Shachar. Is he going to be white or black? Hakobo de Shemayim. All these features are in the hands of heaven. In other words, all the features that happen to you, including wealth, including wealth, even though, you know, that, that's the most interesting of them all. Because, you know, the other ones, one can argue it's a clear nature thing. A person's going to be tall or short. It's a question of nature. But wealth, intelligence, these one could argue is a nurture thing. That says it, Ashi, that there's a certain, when it comes to wealth and, and, and uh, poverty, Ashi stating you can do as you wish, but the wealth and poverty comes from Hashem, finish, Hashem decides how much. And the same thing with intelligence and, and, and foolishness. Even though it might be argued that Rambam says intelligence and foolishness isn't a person's free choice. But anyway, so these kinds of things, in other words, we might frame it like this. Things that, sorry? What? So this is a word. I can't believe it. Let it go. We can we can classify all of these things as I'm gonna make a comment on that in a second. We can classify all these things as items that happen to you. Yeah, this is what all these things are. Avot Sadik Barasha, but to be righteous or wicked, Ainay Bala de Shamayim doesn't come. From the hands of heaven, as Zeb must be other shall that this God gave to man. And God puts before him two paths, and he ought to choose for himself the fear of heaven. So, one thing is clear that Teshuva, by the Gemara standard, is in the free choice of the person. God does not compel or God doesn't make the person do Teshuva. Teshuva is on the person, that that's the essence of Yerushalayim, fear of heaven. It starts with Teshuva. So tshuva then is in the free choice of man. What's not covered, and maybe this is what you're referring to, is whether I choose chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream. That's not on the first list uh, of, of being poor or rich or tall or short. It's not the same thing as chocolate or vanilla ice cream. And um, nor is it in the category of the fear of heaven. All right, so where does Torah stand on that? Rashi seems to say, well, I don't really care if you have free choice or not. Let the philosophers dag it out. Who cares? The main thing is to understand 
what are the things you can control and what are the things you ought to control? Whether vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream is free choice for you, well, who cares? What's the difference? So it's not free choice. Okay, so it is free choice. Like, who cares? What you do know is these are the things Hashem gave me. I'm tall, short, such and such intelligent, such and such wealth. Thank you, Hashem. This is what I have. No reason to kvetch. And as far as what I ought to be caring about is whether I have fear of heaven or not. In other words, what are the things that are relevant is perhaps what Rashi is saying by ignoring these things. That's just a sidebar. Now, uh, to the question of, of, of free choice, the, the direction I'm going here is not specifically to understand how free choice works in Torah. It's not the question today, but just to demonstrate that it is a fact of Torah, not how it operates. How free choice works, the Rambam has a discussion in at least two places in Laws of Tshuva, as well as it is an eight chapter introduction to Perky Ovis. At the end there, in the last two chapters or the last chapter discusses free choice. Um, so this has great discussions about this. The Ikrim has great discussions about this. There's a lot to be said about free choice. And I actually have another series on YouTube. You can go check it out if you want to learn more about that. But here I'm just demonstrating as a matter of fact that as far as Torah is concerned, when it comes to anything with our relationship with God, we have free choice. And thus the Shuva is completely and entirely in our free choice. And the next, uh, the next text, we'll go to the English on page two, on page three, Rambam Laws of Chuba, chapter four, right? Chapter four, uh, chapter five, I'm sorry. And pretty much the entire chapter is dedicated to the question of free choice. And I definitely recommend you to read chapter five of the Laws of Chuba. If the question of free choice is something that, um, something that bothers you. And likewise, have a look at the Rambam's uh, chapter seven and eight of the Rambam's law, the Rambam's eight chapter introduction to uh, Perkyovis. The Rambam wrote an eight chapter introduction to the law to um, to pick to Shmuel Prokim and to to pick Yovis, the ethics of our fathers, and the last two chapters are dedicated to the question of free choice. So I, I actually last summer I did a series on well, two summers ago on the Shmuel Prokim, but I only did the first six chapters. I didn't do the last two. So I, I did not do the part of free choice. I only did the parts that deal with morality, whatever. Anyway, but in in chapter four of the Laws of the Shiva, where the Rambam discusses free choice, he makes a very uh, cogent argument for why one, one must accept that from Torah's perspective, you have free choice. Now, it's how it operates, not the question today, but just to demonstrate that it is a fact of Torah philosophy that a person has free choice in his relationship with God. He makes a very sound and basic argument, which is, uh, page he three. He says in his words in Rome, you have to be a fool that you believe that there's no yeah. free choice. Yeah, it's we're going to see. Yep. Yes, very strong the shine like that. Right. Were God to decree, so he goes on to say that a person has free choice. Then he says, Were God to decree that an individual be righteous or wicked, or that there would be a quality which draws a person by his essential nature to any particular path of behavior, way of thinking, attributes, or deeds, or deeds. See, he includes attributes, which, which in a previous chapter seems to indicate also intelligence. But anyway, so if a person were to conclude, right, that Hashem forces someone to be a certain direction in terms of how he behaves and how he thinks, as imagined by many of the fools who believe in astrology. You know, my astrological sign says this is the way I am, so I'm stuck being me. So he says, Rambam, if that's what you believe, then how could he, God, command us through the words of the prophets, do this, don't do that, improve your behavior, or do not follow after your wickedness? Right? If, if, Torah, if Torah communicates to us and says, please do such and such, that means Torah's view is that we have the choice to do such and such. There's the argument for why you have to believe that Torah is of the view that free choice exists. So how it operates is a good question. We have to deal with that. But we're, what's clear is that as far as Torah is concerned, one does have free choice, certainly in relation to his relationship with God, because God commands him on his relationship. As he goes on to say, according to their mistaken conception, from the beginning of man's creation, it would be decreed upon him or his nature would draw him to a particular quality and he, could not do, and he could not depart from it. So if that were the case, what place would there be for the entire Torah, according to which judgment or sense of justice would retribution be administered to the wicked or reward to the righteous? Shall the whole world's judge not act justly? So someone's being punished for actions that God determined he's going to do. Someone's being rewarded for actions God determined he's doing. So reward and punishment makes no sense. The whole commandment makes no sense if it's no free choice. A person should not wonder how is it possible for one to do whatever he wants and be responsible for his own deeds 
Is it possible for anything to happen in this world without the permission and desire of its creator? As Tom states, whatever God wishes, he has done in the heavens and the earth. So one must know that everything is done in accord with his will. And nevertheless, we are still responsible for our deeds. How is this apparent contradiction resolved? Just as the creator desired that the elements of fire and wind rise upward, and those of water and earth descend downward, that the heavenly spheres revolve in a circular orbit, and all other creations of the world follow the nature which he desired for them, so too he desired that man have free choice and be responsible for his deeds without being pulled or forced. That too is God's desire. And since when can God desire that I have free choice? Rather, he on his own initiative with the knowledge, with the knowledge which God has granted him, will do anything that man is able to do. Therefore, he is judged according to his deeds. If he does good, he's treated with, with benefic beneficence. If he does bad, he's treated harshly. This is implied in the verse in the prophet's statement. This has been the doing of your own hands. They also have chosen their own path. This concept was also implied by King Solomon in a statement. Quote, young man, rejoice in your youth, in your youth but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment, i.e., Know that you have the potential to do, but in the future, you will have to account for your deeds. So however we're going to square away God knowing the future and free choice, one thing is clear. From the perspective of Torah, which is centered around God commanding man to get better, there must be the freedom of choice for man to do so. And the entirety of the prophets is revolved around get better, because if not, God's going to exact retribution revolves around free choice, because if I can't choose to get better, what are you punishing me for? And therefore, however you square it away philosophically, we must accept that free choice is a thing. Okay. Now let's get to our question. So if it's free choice and teshuva is not in the hands of God, but in the hands of man by God's decree, then what kind of appropriate prayer is it to ask God for someone to do teshuva? This is something that God himself says I'm not doing. So what are you asking God to do something he said he's not going to do? This is the Marsha's question. So this is the next text there. This is the Marsha, classic commentary on the, on the Gemara. And you can go to the Yesh Ayin. It's the middle of that paragraph there. One, two, three, six. First, he explains the language of chatoim, meaning sins, versus chaitim, meaning sinners. Right, Beruja tells his wife, the verse doesn't say that sinners shall end, but it says the sin shall end. So first, he explains that that, uh, that language, uh, that, that language about the word there. And then he says, the Yeshla Ayim Bezet, we have to investigate in this whole thing. The Hebrew, right? In the Hebrew, yeah, the second text of the Marsha, on page four. The Rashi script, yeah. The Rashi script. How many lines on it? It's five lines. After the okay. square brackets, under the square brackets, you'll see it says, the Yeshla Ayim, the middle of the line. The line begins with the word Rachamim. Yeah. Six lines down. Yeah. The Yeshla Ayim Bazaar. We have to investigate and think further about this whole story of Broya asking, or Broya and her mayor praying, davening, that their neighbors should do to Shovan and being successful. And Hashem accepts their prayer. That's what the story seems to imply. So the Vadai, because clearly, someone who asks God for himself, asking God that I do to Shovan. That Nicha, that's okay, which is what we do every day in our davening. Every day, three times a day in our davening, we say, Hashivay nu Hashem we ask, um, what's the what's the tefillah? No, 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 after, no, no, right, I, I just, no, 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 I messed up the line, I think, slach lanu, and then we say, no, I'm going blank. We ask God every day, three times a day, please. Yeah, please make us do teshuva. Make us do complete teshuva. We say this in our prayer. So that says the Marsha, Micha, that's okay. That doesn't bother me. Why? Even though, as we just learned, everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heavens. Why am I asking God to? Make me do teshuva. So says the Gemara. Says, says the Marsha. Hari Omru. The Gemara says elsewhere. The path that man wants to go down. He is provided that path. means He's taken down that path. Sorry? He's led down that way. So if you choose to go down a certain direction, 
that God will orchestrate your world to follow the direction that you want to go. So therefore, it's appropriate to say, Hashem, help me do Teshuvah, because I, I want to, I'm trying, and I'm asking you, God, to make the path clear. That's what he's saying the prayer is. And likewise, the Gemara says elsewhere, Haroitzel attire, one who approaches and wants to become more purified. Messiah Loi, God grants help, assistance. So so someone who asks God for mercy on himself, that he himself should be returned into Shuva, the very fact that you are standing in front of God and saying, please help me do Teshuvah, means you want to do Teshuvah. And now you're asking God for the assistance. So there he says, I'm not, I have no problem with that. It doesn't work like this. Huh? The whole idea of Kofi, the guy of Emmett really wants to do Teshuvah. It's the same thing. Come on, the Emmett's a guy. It's true, a person always wants to do Teshuvah. The question, also you're answering the question. Oh, that's a good answer. Okay, we're going to put that. We're going to answer that. That's, that's a good answer. I, no one says that, but that's a good answer. Okay, but let's first understand this question. She says, a person asking to do Teshuvah for himself, that's okay. Because the very fact that he's coming and asking for Hashem's help and doing Teshuvah means he wants to. And the rule is that someone who wants to do Teshuvah is given the assistance. Okay, good. So I'm asking God for the assistance. What's the problem? But asking God for mercy that someone else should do Teshuvah, kasha, it's difficult for me to understand. To what? How could this request help? Ha'aminon, we already established Hakobu De Shemaim, etc. Everything's in the hands of heaven except for he fear of heaven. So, what purpose is there, or how could it help that I ask that someone else do Teshuvah if God says I don't do that? So, why am I requesting that? Right? And the Gemara seems to, uh, let's go back to the story of the Gemara. What does it say? Does it say, the, yeah, the Gemara says, He asked Hashem that they should do Teshuvah, and they actually did. The Gemara seems to say that the, that the prayer worked. They actually did do Teshuvah. So, the Masha is making an argument that what, what the Gemara seems to imply is that God made them do Teshuvah in response to our mayor's prayer. Haven't we established that God does not make people do Teshuvah? So how does the story make sense? Which comes down to how do we ask Hashem to make someone else do Teshuvah? We can't seemingly. But our mayor did. So how do we make sense of the story? God intervened because he prayed. He said, Hashem, please make them do Teshuvah. And they did implying that Hashem intervened. So how does this, how do we make sense of it? And he concludes, and us, that we say in our prayer three times a day, as we noted earlier, please Hashem, grant us to do Teshuvah, like Kasha, this is not a problem, call Kach so much, he's include, even though he says in the plural, that God should make all of us do Teshuvah, but because he's talking about himself primarily at the center of his prayer, so that's him dedicating De demonstrating he wants to do Teshuvah, he's asking Hashem for help. Okay. Then he concludes saying, the Yashiv, we might be able to resolve the issue, um, but doesn't actually tell us what his resolution is. So we're stuck with the question. What is the nature of someone who prays um, for someone else to do Teshuvah? How is it possible? So the way the Marshal framed the question was, like it's, that he didn't say there's a problem to do this prayer, but he really just said, it's, it's of no use. My oil, to what, how, how could it help? Even though the Gemara says it did help for a mayor, but he's asking, how could it help? But now let's look at the next text, the Shulchan Aruch, and it might come out that actually you cannot do it. Not only, not only is it useless, as the Marsha asks, seeming, seemingly it's useless if Hashem says, I don't get involved in your Yer Shemayim, but we're going to learn now another text which might imply that it's actually forbidden to make such a prayer, ask, someone, ask someone else to do Teshuvah. How so? Let's be the, the, why, the, the other way. Obviously, Stroll, I, don't, I see why should you be able to bring us also to the truth? Okay. Can't do so the, okay, so let's see. Levels, let's so let's see. The, the Marshal is asking, the Marshal says it's, it's, so you, it's not going to help because Hashem doesn't intervene. That's what the Marshal is saying. Okay, so and he's asking, first. how come it works for a mayor? Now, now we're going to learn a, now we're gonna learn a source which actually will answer that as to why maybe it's actually a problem. So let's see. The Shulchan Aruch writes, Based on, of course, the based, based on, of course, the Gemara, based, of course, on the Gemara, uh, actually a straight Mishnah. Um, but um, I just quoted the Shulchan Aruch here because this is the final ruling. One who prays for something that has already happened. For example, he entered the city and heard a cry in the city, and he prayed, "May it be God's will that this cry is not from the member of my household." So the, the prayer is is uh, is a useless prayer because it, either there's either the, the sound is coming from your house. Or it's not coming from your house. The sound already exists. 
you're asking, please make it not from my house. And if it's from your house, you're asking God to pick up the sound and move to a different house. What are you asking God? It's already there. Right? And likewise, or if his wife was expecting, that's right, if his wife was expecting, and more than 40 days have passed, she's already in the second trimester, right? At which point the gender is already determined. And he said, may be God's will that my wife will give birth to a boy. So the gender is already there. So what are you praying? Behold, says the Shulchan Aruch, this is a meaningless prayer, which is forbidden. Rather, a person should always pray for the future and give thanks to the past. And he goes on to describe the, the, the proper prayer. So therefore, there are some that would that have expounded on the Marsha's question here. The Marsha asked, to what, of what use is the prayer when Hashem says, I'm not getting involved? But others say the question is even stronger. How could you make such a prayer? If we have this concept that prayers for things that Hashem doesn't, that already exists, meaning it's a thing that Hashem doesn't involve himself with, it's considered a tzvila shav, a meaningless prayer, then perhaps this is also a meaningless prayer. If Hashem says, I'm not getting involved in people's free choice, then what are you asking Hashem to get involved in people's free choice? I already said I'm not doing that. Making it a meaningless prayer. But at the end of the day is, we still have the Gemara, which said that Amir did it, and it was successful. So we have to figure out exactly how. This is but really the whole, the whole title is called Tshuva. You could, sir, it's old. But it's who's doing the Tshuva? like this. It doesn't make a difference. But it's, it's, it's not like a kid's in the stomach, a boy or a girl is there already, or the like right. screaming. It's, the whole thing is that you are able to change. Yeah. So, what's so it's not, it's right. Problem. It's not the same. Shubas to return. It's a good change. point. That's a very good point because it's not exactly the same thing. In the cases where it says here, the, the Shulchan Aruch says it's a meaningless prayer, it's something which already exists. Shiva doesn't exist yet. But there are, there are those who expound the, the, the end but is we're going to. means your turn means change what you're right. doing. Which so means it's, it's not like it So it's not exactly the same thing as the cases of things that already exist. But in some way, one could make the argument it's meaningless if Hashem says I'm not getting involved. So maybe it's not forbidden, Mamish, like it's forbidden to Davin that the gender should change, that's like forbidden. So maybe it's not forbidden, but certainly it's a meaningless prayer. If Hashem says, I'm not doing it. Anyway, the the payo, we know already, we already know from the, we already know from the story of Amir that it's not a meaningless prayer, right? The, just the question is only how. So let's understand this. And, and, I, and, and I think it's, it's gonna reframe how we daven for other people when we, when we, when we get to the answers. It's gonna give us some nice insight. Okay, let's see. So first let's look at Feinstein. Um, the, so now the Hebrew text by Feinstein, where it says you gimel there. Yeah. So this is a bunch. It's a letter with a bunch of questions, and he just answers them like you know one by one by one, as opposed to one long dissertation on one yeah. subject. You know, started on the last line. It says a person should always pay for the future. Pray the means pray. It's missing an R. Pray for the future and give thanks to the past, but you don't you don't do the reverse. You don't thank for the future right. and pray for the past. We pray for the future and thank for the past. Okay. So, no, no, it's, it's, it's a typo. I took the translation from Safari, which is crowdsourced. So yeah. it's not like a definitive translation or authoritative. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, so, Umasha Tiris that which the honorable writer or recipient of the letter responds, Al Tfidas Beruria. In the question of Berurya's prayer, I'll show you for the wicked, show Yeshuva Bachuva that they should do Teshuva. Shehiksha Maharsha, the Masha asks. We saw this Masha, the Brachas, Tafyud, Tafyud, the Chedusha Godes, in the Masha's commentary to the Gemara, he says, he asks, Hakolbi De Shemaim, everything's in the hands of heaven, Chutz Miyir Shemaim, with the exception of fear of heaven. So you, my dear esteemed writer, or my dear esteemed recipient of my letter, says Rabbi Feinstein, you suggested to Ulai that perhaps I date Philos Adam because this happened through the prayer of a person, Ainz and Nikr This is not considered the hands of heaven. So this person suggested an answer like this. You want to pass the Kleenex? He suggested the following answer. Right? It says, everything's in the hands of heaven, with the exception of the fear of heaven. Who caused this teshuva? I did. Let's say I prayed. That someone else did the teshuva, and the other person does the teshuva. So, in whose hands is that? So Mine. So, if it came from my hand, even though it went via heaven, it doesn't violate the rule that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven, because it came from earth, it came from me, even though it may have gone via heaven. That's what this writer suggested to Rabbi Feinstein. 
It's quite a unique, clever approach. Actually, we're going to see later another uh, opinion that actually maintains his argument. This is what he says. I, I know, which is why Rabbi Fatsi says, he knew who Doiche Godol. This is an extremely, Doiche uh, means like a forced answer. It does not settle well with me at all. Because in your prayer, you ask that God do it. This is indeed a question. Because this is something that's left in the hands of man. So you're saying that because God happens to be responding to me, it's not considered from the hands of heaven. But what did you ask? You asked that God do it. So God did it. And now you want to classify that as not God doing it? Like, what are you saying? Stand as this country stand. All right, with the count, huh? What are you missing? It's, it's, yeah. You know, there's another touch. No, if not follow, if not follow, tell me. There's another touch of a color of Shemayim and Chutz Vyosh Shemayim. Everything is from a Shemayim. Chutz Vyosh Shemayim, Yosh Shemayim is 100% he has to give you. That's a Chutz Ah, yeah. yeah. It, it, there's no. Uh... So it, it, it's simple. The person was That's suggesting the that the, the, the statement of the Gemara is everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Right. Fear of heaven equals Teshuvah, right? Right. So this person suggests. And when I ask Hashem for someone else to, to, to do the shuvah, so who caused the guy to do the shuvah? Me. Because it was my prayer. Right. So because it was me, this doesn't violate the rule that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Because I'm because I'm, I'm the one I'm the one invoking it. I mean, I'm increasing. The I'm, no, I, I did it. I did it. In my prayer, I did it. I made it happen. Not heaven. I made it happen. <laughs> so says my Feinstein, what, what are you saying? You asked heaven to do it. Right. And now you want to classify that as not heaven doing it? So what are you, what are you saying? So if I, if I still rejects this answer, we're going to see soon that there are others who actually do accept this answer. Anyway, so if I still continues, therefore we must say, that the prayer is, this is something I could ask for, says Rabbi Feinstein. I'm praying that this other person not be faced with tests. And if he's not given tests of faith, he will do teshuva. Because a person doesn't, wouldn't sin or didn't sin because of lack of parnasa, lack of livelihood and the like. So his circumstances are such that it's difficult for, for him to have faith. And that's why he left the fold. So what am I davening to Hashem for? That he does the shuvah that's in his own hands. I'm asking Hashem to remove the obstacles that are preventing him from doing the shuvah, to make his life circumstances easier that he can do the shuvah. And that's something's in the hands of heaven. Right, because we said we already said wealth is in the hands of heaven, intelligence, even according to the Rashi, is in the hands of heaven. Um, tall, short, good looking, not good looking. So, these are the things that Hashem could do to make his life a little more tolerable, and then he'll do Teshuvah. And that's what I'm praying for. So, this is, a, this is an angle. That's number one. Number two, the Gam Shaykh, it's also possible, Lispalal, to pray as Hashem is part of Yasmin Lehem, that God should orchestrate such a scenario, that they will hear inspiring words from the righteous. And they will do, they will return into Shuvah as a result of the inspiration. This latter explanation seems to be more correct. So this is an interesting tefillah. So my advice is saying like this, I can't daven necessarily that someone should, should do Teshuvah. That's his only free choice. But I could daven that Hashem should organize the situation that he ends up at a Chabad house. And then there he'll get inspired on his own to do Teshuvah. But Hashem situates the circumstances of life, right. especially wealth and poor and, and poverty, right? So Hashem can situate his business that he has to end up doing business with so-and-so, which takes him to so-and-so, which leads him to a place where he hears an inspiration of Abraham. And then he does Teshuvah. So even if Hashem isn't making them do Teshuvah, Hashem can certainly orchestrate the world in such a manner that it's conducive for Teshuvah. And that I can pray for. Very interesting angle. Okay, so that's Rabbi Five. These are ways of getting around it, but they're also ways of reframing how we think of like it's exactly reframing. You know, it also reframes how we daven, how we think of other people and daven for them. Okay, it adds that. It adds a certain element of like I don't know. Think about it. That I, I I enjoy this, but let's see. Sorry. Yeah, it's good. You have to, it's, you have to reframe every word sounds. So now we have the Tzitzeliezer. The Tzitzeliezer, our friend, 
our, our we've already we've Baruch Hashem read quite a bit of him already, Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg. And this is a uh, letter he wrote to someone who sent, submitted a book to him, or at least uh, maybe certain pages of a book. And he's commenting on a number of things that the person wrote in his book. So at Vov, which is in the right-hand column there, the second page, uh, second page, where it says on top, Sitzeliezer. The right-hand column, towards the bottom, you'll see a little Vov, and then it says Besimin Beis. Yep. Yep. So yep. comment number, he, he, he writes a number of comments in the person's book. So comment number six on the manuscript we submitted. Comment number six. Besimin Beis, in section two of your book, this is what my Walderberg's telling the writer, Bahara Misbar 5, in footnote number five, Mitzayin, you cite, um, you know, the honorable you writer, you cite Le Marsha to the Marsha, which we learned at the beginning, Brachas Dafyud, Amad Aleph, on Brachas page 10a. And you cite it there incorrectly. You write that according to the Marsha, that the prayer of one person is effective on another, that the other person should do to Shuvah, even though we have the rule that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. That's how you cite it to the Marsha. So it says it's Zelazar, first of all, Lloyd Duck, you misunderstood the Marsha. The Marsha is the reverse, the other, but the contrary. The Marsha is asking this premise. The Gemara seems to give the premise that you could, and it is effective to pray for someone else to do Teshuvah. The Marsha questions that premise. Based on Based on the fact that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven, right? That was our original opening problem. The Kaiser, the Marsha writes, but to ask God for mercy that someone else do teshuva kasha is difficult, says Marsha. To what effectiveness could his prayer be? We've already established everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven, etc. So you cited the Marsha as proof that it is effective to pray for someone else. You misunderstood the Marsha, says Tzitzeliezer. The Marsha says the reverse. He questions the premise and says, I don't see how it could be effective. Now, when we saw him the Marsha concludes his words, and we saw this earlier, the Lashim with the language of, quote, Yesh Yashiv, we can resolve the question. But the Marsha himself does not tell us in what way he resolves the issue. Okay. Now, I also looked into that which you, dear honorable recipient of my letter, that you cite in your book, in your manuscript, that which was written in this subject, in the response of Rabbi Feinstein, the Igus Moshe, which is the passage we just finished reading from the Igus Moshe from Rabbi Feinstein. And I saw, says Rabbi Waldenberg, he backhandedly makes light of the question. And there's no like, I have nothing willing really to respond to what Rabbi Feinstein said, as the one who reads it will see. Like he makes it the question is no big deal. Yeah, you just daven that Hashem should orchestrate the world to make him to teshuva. Or daven that his circumstance should get better so that way he doesn't have so many challenges. He makes light of the whole question. You, this is a very serious issue, says Rabbi Waldenberg. This is not uncommon where scholars read the response of other scholars and there's responses back and forth. We, well, what's wrong with we the saw this with the question of heart transplant and all things like that. Sorry? The whole the whole question of the Chutzmir Shemayim. You know, ways to get there, like, it's like, you know. That's what Rafi says? Yeah, it's, it's, But let's see. But Rabbi says it's a much more serious question than that. Ulam, however. Everything in the world. Yeah. So Rafi, Rabbi Waldenberg now tells the, tells the writer, tells the, the person who wrote to him, the person who submitted the manuscript, you misunderstood the Marsha. Technical issue. You thought that the Marsha was supporting the notion of effectiveness of prayer. For someone else to show when actually Marshall was challenging that premise, you said it to Rabbi Feinstein. I have nothing to say to Rabbi Feinstein because he kind of makes light of the question. But here's what I will tell you. Ulam, however, ideally, I will inform you, him in the third person, but he means the writer. I will inform you. She is a chuva the flaw. There's a beautiful and wondrous response. The Shiloh Shuva is Mi'il Tzedakah. Simon Zion. In section seven of a response called Mi'il Tzedakah. He deals with this question of the effectiveness of praying for someone else, the Teshuvah. The Kaisa writes about this, he writes a number of different classifications and ways of thinking about this. And here is the gist of them. So before we go to the gist of how Rabbi Waldenberg gives a summary of the Me'il Tzedakah's 
um, Shuva, let's go back to the text sheet. I want to show you the question that there were, that that he re, he um, received. We're not learning the actual full meal stalker, although it's a very beautiful Shuva. It's long. It's un, it's uh, it's physically unclear, as you can see. The text is very physically unclear, and he goes back and forth and back and forth. So I thought it'd be better just to get a, a rounded view of what he says rather than going through his whole argument. But I wanted to nonetheless read with you the question. Because the question gives you a window into history. Just Bukhlal, responsa is a window is a window into the history of ordinary Jews like no other. You know, like if a historian 100 years from now wanted to know what today's day was like, he would have to hack into our emails. And hack into our emails would tell you what everybody's busy with, right? Uh, try to do that from a thousand years ago. Whose emails do you hack into? Nobody. You got to read letters. But who's writing letters a thousand years ago? People can afford to write letters, and people know how to actually write. So you don't get a good window into what the simple people were dealing with. Right? But when it comes to responsa, you do, because you see questions from simple people dealing with simple problems as they're writing them to their rabbis. So you end up getting like a real feel for what, was, what life was like. So now this responsa is written to a rabbi named Rabbi Yoyna Lansdorfer. And as you can see, I wrote in the top there on page five, he was born in, 1712, uh, born in 1678 and died in 1712. So he was a very young man. How old is, how old is he? 22 or 12. 24, 34. So he's 34 years old and died. Young man. And he published something like uh, five, six, seven books. Became a rabbi in Bohemia. Right, that uh, Bohemia is in the region in Czechoslovakia. And is hailed by his contemporaries as a great scholar. Even though he's 34 years old and he died. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So he writes this responsa to a city somewhere else. So he's in Bohemia. This young little rabbi gets a letter from Shaila question Beir Azmir. In the town of Ajmer. No idea where that is. Anybody know Ajmer? Ajmer. He gets a question from the town of Ajmer. What, what is the name of the town? Aj Ajmer. It's written in Hebrew. Aleph, Zion, Mem, Yud, Resh. It's Azmir or Ajmer with a Z. Maybe or Ajmer. I'm not sure. I think that's what it is. Maybe I'm misreading it, but I think it's Ajmer. Anyway. So he's receiving, receiving this question and he writes back with such beautiful sensitivity. It's a really nice, um, anyway, so this is the question he gets. One person left his religion. To another religion. The person clearly would seem, I don't know where Ajmer is, but probably converted to Christianity or Islam, one of the two. But he left Judaism and went to a different religion. The and, he, and when he left his religion, he took with him also Benoit Katan, his young child. Now, the people of the town are in doubt. Sham, the people there in the city are in doubt. I'm not sure you if it's a, sorry? Yeah, the people in Ajmer writing this question. There's a member of the community, it's, 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 it's you know, as, tight, as towns were in those days, tight towns, everybody knows everybody. And you have to remember that, that your religion is not just your free choice like it is today. We have separation of church and state. Your religion was your citizenship. So if you stop being Jewish, it means you left, you, you, you physically picked up, moved away from somewhere else. We never saw you again. We never heard from you again. Guy's gone. And he took one of the, he took a little child. So the community's always the distraught. And the community is in doubt. In Rashoya Machedim, is it appropriate for others, us, the others in the town, to pray for this fellow, that he come back. Hashem, that Hashem should bring him back to his service, the service of God. And should God, is it appropriate to pray that God grant in his heart that he do complete and full teshuva. It's so far off that we don't even know like if, if there's an opening, if there's a possibility for him to come back, does he even care to come back? We know nothing. The guy disappeared with the son and he abandoned Judaism and he's gone. What do we do? Can we, can we pray for him? It's just so, uh, it's just a window into like the way people live, the way people thought, the way people cared. So this is the question that he comes to. So now let's see the Tzitzeliezer's uh, summary of the various different points that the that Rabbi uh, Lansdorfer makes. You know what Why would they even think it? Be sure you pray for someone. Why would it even be a question that someone said? That's what I don't care. Tell you this is what they uh, this is what they wrote to him. So he writes the question is doubled. Number one, maybe it's a wasted prayer. It's a meaningless prayer. It's filashov, and maybe um, he also writes something that someone said earlier, which is he writes maybe you would argue that these are the kinds of things that if Hashem wants, he'll do on his own. I don't mix in. But maybe if Hashem wanted him to remain Jewish, he would have remained Jewish. 
those are the two sides to why he says maybe one shouldn't pray. But then goes through, as we'll see in a moment, uh, six different scenarios in which it is completely and fully okay to pray for someone else to do teshuva. And all those scenarios apply to that guy and his son. And for people today, you're going to see it applies even more. So let's see. So in the last paragraph, page Sadaqas on the right-hand side, Aleph. You're back to the Hebrew. Back to Cecilia, so back to the Hebrew, yeah. So I was just showing you the question that was fielded to Rabbi Lanz, therefore. And uh, one page before that, Mayor. Sadiches and Sadiches. Sadiches on the bottom. Yeah. So Rabbi Waldenberg is now going to summarize the various different points that Rabbi Lanz, therefore, made. We're following where we are. Like all Cecilia, uh, yeah, so right there is Aleph there. Yeah. Okay, we can, we can begin by Ulam. So okay. again, the Tzitzeliezer, the Tzitzeliezer Waldenberg is a contemporary. Let's get the get the whole scenario down. The Tzitzeliezer is a, is a contemporary, lives in Yerushalayim, and he's commenting, he's writing a letter back to someone who sent him a manuscript of a book, and he's commenting. In this book that Rabbi Waldenberg received in the last 60 years, probably, I don't know how long ago, but he's contemporary. So within the century, he receives his manuscript, and he's responding to something the guy wrote about the question of, may you daven for someone else. And everybody, Waldenberg writes, so you sent me a copy of your manuscript, in it you misquote the Marsha, and then you quote Rabbi Feinstein. But let me tell you about another source that deals with this question, and it's a beautiful source. This is what Rabbi Waldenberg is saying. That source that Rabbi Waldenberg, Waldenberg is talking about is from Rabbi Lansdorf for, in a response called Me'il Tzedaka, who lived in Bohemia in somewhere between in the early 1700s, in the late, in the late, in the, um, early 18th century, young 35 year old rabbi or less than 35 years old because he died at 35, died at 34. So Ulam, however, says Rabbi Waldenberg to the person who wrote the manuscript and misquoted the Marsha, ideally I will inform you, my dear recipient of the letter, there's a wonderful responsa, in the responsa known as section seven, we just read the question, right? Rabbi Lanz, therefore, who I will he deals with this question. The Kaisib is a Kamav Kamak Doris, and he writes various different classifications. And the following are a brief synopsis of the main points that Rabbi Lanz, therefore, makes. Aleph, number one. Moyal, prayer is effectiveness. Pray, prayer is effective. Praying for someone else to do Teshuvah, sorry? Same page. Same page in the bottom, where it says little Aleph there. Last paragraph on the right, there's a little Aleph inside. Oh, okay, Aleph. Moyel, it is effective. If the person who is praying is pained by the behavior of that person who needs to do teshuva, then the prayer helps. Because in this case, it's not just that I'm asking Hashem for someone to do teshuva. I'm asking Hashem that my pain come to an end. And thus, that's a prayer that's valid. So on the one hand, you might think, this is a selfish consideration. I'm in pain. But on the other hand, there's a very deep message here. Don't pay lip service and say, oh, I'm praying for someone else to do teshuva on the side. You know, I'm, I, I, leave me alone, I'm good, right? because I prayed for them. Do you want to pray for them? Feel the pain. Do you feel the pain of that, of that Jew who drifted? Do you feel the pain of this community member who left? And if you do, you can pray, says the, says the, says the Rabbi Lanz, therefore, who Rabbi Waldenberg is quoting. Number two, Bayes, Moyel, the prayer is effective. Kishahim burdim ba'amaratzim. When the people you're praying about are ignorant. They're ignorances, they're born. And these people who are misbehaving, who need to do teshuva, are behaving because they don't know. They don't know. It's not like they cho chose to left Judaism and now we're expecting them to choose to come back. That maybe you could say it's their hands and whatever, you can't pray. But these are people who don't know anything. And people like this, it's appropriate. The law would, would see fit. The spell lane to pray for them. Just like you pray for every sickness. A person sick physically, you pray for him. So a person is sick with lack of knowledge and information, pray that he get the information he needs. Okay, but we're talking about a person that went off the way, not that he doesn't know it's it. So this, okay. this one's not... Uh, we're just giving a general outline, yeah? So maybe this one doesn't apply to that case. Oh, actually it does because the person went with his kid. Right? The, the, the case of Elijah before was... A father, a man left the community. The kid and he, yeah, the kid doesn't know anything. You can pray, certainly pray for the son. Oh, so okay, so, that's so it's for him, 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 it applies. And certainly nowadays, for most people, this applies, if not to everybody. 
That's number two. Number three. People that go off the way, they know it. They just. Uh... They're the declared ones that today everybody classifies as Tzimik Shinish, but everybody classifies as anybody who's out of, uh, doesn't uh, perform as an Orthodox Jew as, uh, is considered someone who's not at his fault. Never said, I can't, I can't remember the source, I have to find it. But even someone, yeah, even someone who grew up religious and decided to leave, it's certainly because he wasn't treated, taught properly and wasn't treated properly and therefore it's not his fault. And even he said there was a connection. So Imagine that. That's, maybe that's why, because it is. Th- so it does, exactly. it does classify. Lacks knowledge. So we have number one is that's if I feel the pain of the other person, I can pray. It's effective. Number two, if um, it's just because of lack of knowledge, which if we can take the Rebbe's argument, that's for everybody. Because if they would know, they would, they would be in. Number three, Moyal Av Abanoi, a father praying for a child is effective. The Matsinu, because we find Abba, that a son can be meritorious based on the father. So the father certainly could pray for his child, that his merit help this, his son who, who left in Cain. And more, and if so, even moreover, point one was if you're in pain, you're, the prayer is effective, then certainly this father is in pain. So never mind that, it, that any father can pray for their child because. Merit goes down generation, but the parents in pain. So certainly the prayer is effective. Number four, the prayer is effective for children. Why? Each Jew is like a father to every orphan Jew. So even if this any random child who's alone and, and needs to do teshuva, every other Jew can pray for them because that child is like his child. Okay, that's katana. Right. For, for children. Unbelievable. Right. The, the, the beauty of the, so, uh, the it's, it's, it's a real sensitivity to this, you know, not just that, I'll go pray for them. There's, there's, there's a real, like, um, almost a fabrengen to understand what it means to, to really care for someone else and pray for them. Number five, moil, the prayer for, for someone else to the is moil is effective. When the Jew already has the notion of wanting to do teshuva. He has a, a, a little awakening for teshuva inside of him. And now we're praying that that little spark that he feels should go all the way. It's as if they began the process. Where God says, I help from heaven. And this, we might say, every Jew has that little awakening. And therefore, certainly you could pray that his awakening be flamed all the way to the end. It's very beautiful. The, the obviously, Sarah comes oozing out of this. Vav, number six. Certainly it works for people who are considered as stuck in their wickedness. Because this is where they grew up. Go look at, at length in the text of, the, of Rabbi Lansdorfer and you'll see the beautiful language how he elaborates on all these six points. So 100% very, very so gishmak. Every way you yeah. He comes, but he comes with like a schmuck way of how to do it. Not just um, go do it because it's okay. He gives like a real juice to it, feeling empathy, the pain, a father like a child. Any child is your is like your your should should feel the pain of every child as if it's your own child. Yeah, every Jew has a spark in his heart, and you want it to keep it going. I mean, this, this is very beautiful. Okay. He concludes. Very recently, I was asked this question from a very famous. Uh, Dean of a school, like a Rosh Hashiva, Echad, Shoyam Mo'id Novok Pazay. He was very confused about this question. And I showed him the words of Rabbi Lanz Defor in his response on Me'il Tzedakah. V'nachad Aitai. And this great Rosh Hashiva calmed down. He finally got, got closure on his question that was bothering him all the time. He, They open up great, uh, you know, great horizons. And understanding the words of our sages in this. The common is in various different other areas. We quote different sources. We also get a better perspective on the prayers that we have established. Which have been established for us. In various different versions. The Tvila for prayers. From oneself. I should do Teshuvah. And others. They should do Teshuvah. So Rabbi, Rabbi Waldenberg. You see now you understand why Rabbi Waldenberg was saying. That Rabbi Feinstein just kind of backhandedly gave an answer. And didn't give it enough weight. When you read the Mi'il Tzedakah, once you read the beauty that comes along with, and the empathy that comes along with what Rabbi Lanzdefor wrote, the Tzitzilias is like, 
You just said that it's okay just because it's okay. You didn't give it all the juice that the land that forgave it's missing. So let me let me show you this real place where it has this really gishmak answer. So it's, I thought it was very nice. Okay. In conclusion, final uh, angle. Getting back right to the beginning. Rabbi Feinstein, you can go to the next page. The last page on this uh, Hebrew, second to last page of the Hebrew text. Rabbi Feinstein said that uh, you, my the dear uh, reader of my letter, you wrote, Rabbi Feinstein said this earlier, that you, the dear reader, wrote that why is it okay to pray for someone else to do teshuva? Because it's not God doing it, it's my prayer doing it. And Rabbi Feinstein rejected that because, what do you mean? You, you just ask God to do it for you. But here we're going to see um, two sources which actually maintain that view that when I ask Hashem for someone else to do teshuva, it's not Hashem doing it, it's me doing it. And it doesn't violate the principle that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. So let's see. This comes from a book called Siach Hasada, which is a book by Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky. It's a great. What's the mechanism for that? I, I doesn't, does, he doesn't say. And you don't understand doesn't say. I do understand the question, but it doesn't say. Yeah. So, it's, so they're arguing that you get, when, you, when that happens, when you pray for someone else to get, to get healed He's and they get healed, They'll argue that that's your, you get the credit. Get the credit yes, because you did this, because you pressed the spiritual buttons to make it work. Did you really? It's, that's, that's presumably how it works, right? So same thing here. You, you press the spiritual buttons for him to get to Shiva. So it's not from heaven, it's from you. That's kind of how they're thinking about it. Maybe. Let's see. Let's see. Or no, that's the other way. The guy really wanted it already. Like all the six answers. That would be it's fine, like but that's not that's not what they, that's not what they're saying. It's not what the person wrote, right? It's that's a good that that's right, but that's not what the guy's saying. Oh, which I, that's, that reminds me, you were saying <laughs> that uh, the Allah, the Rambam rules that every Jew really wants to do what Hashem wants, and just he needs something, and it's his evil inclination that got the best of him. He just needs to. So that would fall in line with what we just finished saying that every Jew really wants to, right. and if you're praying that it should be come out to the whole. Okay, so let's see um, where it says Yud Gimel. I'm sorry, where it says Yud, the second paragraph in the right-hand column, where, again, this comes from a book called Siyah Hasada, which is a book by Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, the great Gadol, who lives in Eretz Yisrael. And... Um, oh, yeah, that was his estrog. Yep, that was his estrog, yeah. And in the back of this book, Siyah Hasada, there's a section called Kuntris Yishev Hadas. So this is like a commentary, like little snippet commentaries on the Gemara. So... The second commentary there on the right, where it says Yud Aleph, that is to say page Yud A, side A. So that's the Gemara, which said the story of Ruria. So he says, the Gemara says, the verse says, let sinners end. I'm sorry, let sins end, not sinners, right? Which therefore Ruria argued, yeah, don't, they shouldn't sins. die, they should better do Teshuvah. So the Marsha in his commentary asks, Ma moil what kind of effectiveness could there be for a prayer on a friend, on someone else? She Yoshev, he did the Hare Yaakov, De Shamayim, Chutz, etc. Seemingly, it's in the hands of heaven. They're just repeating the same question. You don't have to get all excited every time. Just repeating the same question from Marshall. The more I think about it, it's more like, yeah, yeah. It's all the same question. Yeah. So, says Rabbi Feinstein, says Rabbi Kanievsky, here's how you can resolve the question of the Marshall. Lefi Mashakos of Chazanish, based on that which the Chazanish writes, Saif Erechayim, at the end of his commentary to the Code of Jewish Law, section one of the Code of Jewish Law, where there Chazan Aish writes, the Masha Baidit Philos Adam, something that has been accomplished through the prayer of man, aims at Nikra Bindesha Mayim, that does not constitute as being in the hands of heaven. Because it's the guy down here who pressed the buttons to make it happen, and therefore it doesn't violate the precept that everything's in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Okay, so he just said the words, but didn't give an explanation. So let's look up the Chazan Aish from the next page. Here, maybe we'll get a little bit of words. Um, maybe we'll get a little bit of words to answer your question exactly how the mechanism works. Maybe we'll get a little bit. Let's see. So the bottom right hand column where it says Dvarim. Dvarim in the book of Dvarim, that is Deuteronomy, the Chomish, chapter Hey, Chavav, chapter uh, verse 26, it reads, Miyitem the Goimer. The verse goes on to say, uh, who will grant that you will have a heart that will serve God? Right? Me, 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 that's the verse says. says it to the people. So, comments the Chazanish. 
Hamakim Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, Maniach as Abchir Be'ad Adam leaves the choice in man's hand. Avla Adam, but the but man Rashi is capable. Lachriach as Re'eul Avedoses Baruch, he can compel or inspire someone else to serve Hashem. Bein Bikfia, whether forcibly, Bein Bepitoy, whether he inspires him. V'lehav a bit Labchira, and the fact that one person inspires another to action is not a negation of the first person's free choice. Because the person who is getting inspired and thus behaving that way, oh, sorry, because the person who's doing the compelling is doing it free choice. Even if I, even if I force someone to do the mitzvah, it's still by free choice because it's my free choice. And all Jews are like one big person. Spiritually speaking, we're one big body. Here's the mechanism. Bahainu mi yitin. And this is the meaning of the verse where Moshe Rabbeinu says, who will give, that will give you a heart that serve God. Meaning to say, who will be there amongst you people? Shehiyah bein tzadikah adar. That there should be amongst the righteous of the people. Mishtadlim, who put effort. Lekadav leiv kalam levad the seis parach. Who put effort into bringing the people's hearts near to serve Hashem. So he says like this. When one man compels another man to serve Hashem, that's not considered taking away his free choice because we're all one big body and one big person, and the person doing the compelling has free choice. So it's not my free choice, but it's our collective free choice as a body of Jewish people. Right? Interesting word. But sorry? Yeah, because that's, we're all brothers. So no, not, not, just, not just brothers. We're all we're spiritually one, one body. One. Right? Like this is a very Tanya idea, right. even though it comes from the Gemara. Yeah, even though it's the Chazanish. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Actually, it's not the first time where I've seen the Chazanish Use language that sounds very much like Siddhis in terms of the neshama. He he. One that 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 that. One of the things we did. That Rambam I said, I'm right. I mean, takes it all the way to the end. Even if he screams and says, I don't want, and Chazanish says, No. Deep down, he really does want. Chazanish Mamish takes it all the way to the end. Okay. So since we're all one great body, so even if it's not my individual free choice, it's not a negation of free choice, considering that it's coming from the free choice of the totality of the body of the Jewish people. Just expressed in one person inspiring another or compelling another. But the Holy One, blessed be He, he doesn't actually himself plant in someone's heart that they should come close. Because then, if Hashem were to compel the heart of man to come forward, then that activity that this person comes forward would not be the result of the creation, it would be the result of Creator. However, if someone prays to God, for someone else to come closer, and God listens to, to his prayer. So this closeness, this teshuva that Hashem does is associated by whom? To whom? The brew of the created being. Because because it was compelled by the, by the prayer of a creation. And even though it comes via God, but because just like in the first scenario where I compel, in other words, the question is who's compelling the system? If it's, if it's being compelled by humans, it constitutes this free choice and not a negation of, of free choice, even if though one person isn't choosing, right? So same thing here, even though my compelling other person to the truth is coming via God, but I'm doing the compelling. And thus it doesn't take a cost of violation of the free choice. It's quite the, uh, a little bit more language to what that person wrote to Rabbi Feinstein. Behind the Amr of it, uh, the Amr of Avedizara, Hey Amad Aleph, and this is then the meaning of the Gemara in Avedizara, uh, page five, uh, number A, side A. So let's look at the Gemara quickly, and then we'll come back to the, the Chazanish, and then we'll conclude. So the last text on page five of the English one it says the Gemara Avedizara. The sages taught with regard to the verse which we. This is the verse we just quoted. Who would give that they had such a heart as this always to fear me? and keep all the commandments, that it might be good for them and with their children forever. Right, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, like, who's the one that's gonna grant you such a heart that will continue making sure you serve Hashem completely, right? Which, one second, not Hashem, but, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, who, who would give it? As in like, where's this guy? So the Chazanish translated it to mean that Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, let there be other people in your generation who are gonna inspire everybody. Because God doesn't do it, because God doesn't compel, right? But let there be people who will inspire others, and that doesn't constitute a violation of free choice because it's coming from the people. That, that was the Hasanish's reading of this verse. But now it says the Gemara this 
At a later stage, Moshe said to the Jewish people, ingrates, children of ingrates. Yeah? When the Holy One, blessed be, he said to the Jewish people, who would give that they have such a heart as this always? You ingrates, says Moshe Rabbeinu, should have said, you, God, should give us a heart to fear you. So when Hashem came and said, who's going to give you a heart? The Jews should have turned around and said to God, you give us the heart. So what's the meaning of this? Doesn't God not grant heart? Now we have the answer. <coughs> because if Hashem granting the heart comes as a result of the prayer of the people, then even though it comes through Hashem, but because the people are the one that's doing the manipulating, they're the one that's, the one that's compelling the system, then it doesn't take away their free choice. And therefore, had they turned back to Hashem and said, you give us the heart, Hashem would have given it. And it would have been considered their free choice. So Moshe says, you missed the opportunity. Hashem offered. And you just stood there. Okay, so there's going to be tzaddikim throughout the generation that are going to inspire you. But you could have said, you got to do it. Pretty powerful, as he concludes. So behind the Amru, is going back to the main text of the Chazan Ishir. Behind the Amru, this then is the meaning of the Gemara in Tractate of Adizara, page 5a. The Jewish people should have said, you, God, should give us a heart. But not so the meaning of this is, by through the fact that they tell Hashem, you give it. And then Hashem gives it. Then had, because they would, had they asked for it, then it would have been granted permission, so to speak, for God to give them the heart. Keeping choice, I'll pay to lost them because God's doing it based on their prayer. And therefore would not violate his own rule that he doesn't mix in because he's responding to their prayer. And when they make a prayer, the mixing in is not on God's terms. It's on the pray people praying. And therefore it's associated to them. So here we have quite a few angles in trying to understand exactly what this means. We pray for others to do Teshuvah. So I found it very interesting doing the research. Hope you found it interesting listening. And God willing, uh, next week I'm going to find the response on the bikes. With God's help. From this year, I have to 100%. Yeah, All certainly. Right. We, we started out by knowing that, of course, you have to pray for him because we have the story of, of Rabbi Meir and Beruya, and they were successful, right? The only question is exactly how to understand it. And in this whole journey, we got a lot of understanding of what tefillah is, what uh, some history, some this and that. And also, just change out the chutzvah or shemayim, the, the chutzvah shemayim, you have no problems with it. Yeah. Everything else, you can get back and forth, but chutzvah or shemayim, he has to give yeah. it. Yeah. So there's no question. Every year, like Tanya says, have a treasure of Yerushalayim already in him, and he's got to go dig it up. That was your opening. All right, a wonderful evening. Have a good evening. All right, fine. Thank you.